Welcome to Lesson 5, Building Additional Skills for Data Analysis. In this lesson, we build more sophistication in data extraction, transformation, and analysis. We'll learn more default DIC skills, which works to pivot and accumulate data. We'll also use default DIC to reverse a one-to-many mapping. Next, we'll explore the CSV reader and how to partially consume iterators. We'll also review Python's core looping idioms and the effective use of assertions. At the end of the lesson, you will be fluent with Python's rich toolset for loading and preparing data for analytics. What we're going to do next is apply uh, k-means to an analysis of voting blocks in uh, Congress. And there's some preparation that we need to do. We'll go take a look at the tools uh, that will come up in that exercise. So for uh, this lesson, we'll prepare for that tooling. There's a handful of things that uh, we'll need, and the first one is collections default dict. We've already used it for grouping. Now we'll use it in a couple of other ways. We'll use it for accumulating data, uh, which is sometimes called tabulating, and then also we'll uh, use it to reverse a one-to-many mapping, which is a core data analysis skill. We'll take a look at uh, the glob module, how to read files with an encoding. Uh, we'll take a look at consuming iterators uh, using next. Use the CSV reader. Uh, go over the standard Python looping idioms for high-level Python. We'll revisit uh, counter and show how to increment using counter. Very straightforward procedure. And then how to use assertions in code. Some of this will be reviewed for you, but most of it ought to be material that shows you how to uh, put together high-level Python. Once we've got the tools out of the closet, in the next lesson, we'll snap them all together and go analyze all of the uh, voting data for the 114th U.S. Uh, Congress. Let's begin. From collections, import default dict. What we had learned before is that uh, default dicts are used for uh, grouping, but they can be used for another purpose, for accumulating uh, uh, data. So I'll make a uh, dictionary that's a default dict, and we can accumulate information about people, a series of uh, characteristics for them. This will be very useful for us when we tabulate uh, votes. So the default dict will be a list, and the idea is we're altering the direction of a tabulation. So perhaps we have data that starts out by giving you a characteristic of a favorite color, red. And then it gives me the favorite characteristic color of Rachel, which of course is blue. And the next person is Matthew, who comes in at yellow. The idea is the contents of uh, the default dict at this point has a list of characteristics for uh, each person. And if we were to take a look at that default dict, we'd see each person maps to a corresponding color. This is best seen using pprint. In fact, whenever you're doing non-trivial data analysis, pprint is one of your best friends. And so we've uh, tabulated at this point one color for each person. But now the data set looks back over the people and tells us another characteristic, what kind of uh, computer they have. I clearly have a Mac. Rachel is a uh, Windows programmer, so she's got a VC. Matthew's just a little boy who has a little VTech computer. Notice that the order of the information coming in is we've got it ordered by person, always Raymond, Rachel, and Matthew. However, we're now getting a new characteristic for each of the people, the Mac, the PC, and the uh, VTech. So if we were to go do pprint once again, we take a look that we are accumulating all of the characteristics of each person. I could go through several more rounds and then each column in this accumulation each column will represent some different characteristic. The default dict is mainly useful during the accumulation phase because it builds the initial uh, list. But after that's done, we don't actually need a uh, default dict and we can convert it to a dictionary because we no longer need its uh, defaulting behavior once all of the data is accumulated. Some people find that a little easier to look at and a little bit more uh, interchangeable with other functions that expect regular dictionaries instead of default dictionaries. In other words, it's very common to use a default dict for accumulation and then to use it to convert it to a regular dictionary for normal use after the accumulation phase. So far, we've seen two uses of default dict. Default dict can be used for grouping, which we did in a previous lesson. And in this lesson, we use it for data accumulation. This is particularly important when your data doesn't come in the order that you actually want to process it a little bit later, and that will apply in our uh, congressional example. 
There's one other use case for default DICs that I really like, and I think it's a core data analysis skill, and that's how to invert or reverse a one-to-many mapping. So let's take a look at the, how we model a one-to-many mapping. We model one-to-many with a dictionary where the key is the one, and the value is the list of the many. So like we had up above, the list is uh, the value and the key is a scalar. So let's look at a sample one-to-many dictionary. I've got a English to Spanish dictionary. Let's say one is uno, showing off my very impressive knowledge of Spanish. Two, dos, three, tres. And then the English word trio doesn't have a uh, direct equivalent in Spanish that I know of, so we'll also map it to trace. Further, we'll also include the Spanish word libre. Libre has uh, two translations. The English word is free, and the Spanish word is libre, which means available, or gratis, which means free of charge. To do one to many, the many is always a list, so each of these will have a list inside it. And so this is the normal pattern for a one-to-many relationship. The one is the scalar key, and the many is a list. In this case, we only have one of the many listed, or one instance of many. And if I pretty print this, we can uh, show the structure of it. E2S with 40. And the uh, dictionary has rearranged the uh, order of all of the uh, entries. And we have libre and gratis going first. So this is actually a very common arrangement of data. In fact, uh, if we go out and take a, a look at uh, Google, we can go define free. The word free has multiple meanings. As you can see, this is actually quite a common way to think about the data. We've got a scalar as the key, and then we have a list as uh, multiple values. The question then becomes, how do you invert a one-to-many uh, dictionary? It will also have a one-to-many relationship because three and trio each uh, map to the same value. So we can loop over the English to Spanish dictionary, getting the English word, which maps to possibly one or more Spanish words in the E2S uh, items. Well, I want to build, uh, build my base dictionary here. S to E is a default dict, which is a list, which we'll use to model a uh, one-to-many relationship loop over the English to Spanish dictionary, the English word and all of the Spanish words in the English to Spanish dictionary. For every English word, there's possibly multiple Spanish words. That's a list, and we can loop over them for each Spanish word in the Spanish words. Two for loops because it's a two-dimensional uh, data structure. And then what we'd like to do is in S to E, look up that Spanish word. The Spanish is the key. And the value is always a list, and we can go append uh, to that list the corresponding English word. So now we have our Spanish to English dictionary and our English to Spanish dictionary. The learning points are a way to model a one-to-many uh, relationship is to put the one as a key and the many as a list. The technique for building up such dictionaries is to use a default dict mapping to a list. That's a very common way to represent data, one to many. The technique for inverting it is to flatten the data structure by looping over the first dimension, then looping over the second dimension. That will give us one English word for one Spanish word. Given that the Spanish word might have multiple English values, we append uh, to the list. And so we can see trace mapped to uh, three and trio and free map to uh, Libre and Gratis. Hope you enjoyed that. Once you've got the hang of this and have seen it done uh, once or twice, it's actually very easy to uh, invert a, uh, a dictionary that has a one-to-many relationship. However, there's a simpler case. What if it's just a one-to-one -one relationship? What mathematicians call a bijection or one-to-one -one and on-to. If we had a simpler uh, dictionary, we could have inverted it uh, directly in place using a dictionary comprehension. So let me go back to the simpler case. The simpler case is we have a dictionary where one is uno, two is dos, and three is trace. At this point, we don't have a many relationship, so there's not a list on the right-hand side, and the same value is not used more than once. 
This is a bijection. Each word in English has exactly one word in Spanish. Each word in Spanish has exactly one word in English. So how do we invert that? It's quite easy. We can make a for loop looping over the English word and the Spanish word in the items. This is simpler than before. Last time we had to loop over all of the Spanish words. And then we can build a dictionary using a dictionary comprehension where this time the Spanish word is the key and the English word is the value. So now you have two techniques. One technique inverts bijections very simply with a uh, dictionary comprehension that simply swaps the key and the value. The other technique handles the more complicated situation where you have one to many. We create a default dict. We flatten the two-dimensional data structure by looping over the outer dimension, then looping over the inner dimension. Once we have a pair of scalars, we accumulate it in the default dictionary. So now you know three use cases for a default dict. There's grouping, there's accumulation, and then there's reversing a one-to-many mapping. Hope you're enjoying the skill building. Once you uh, know these patterns and idioms, it becomes uh, somewhat easy to express big ideas with only a little amount of code in Python. And so this becomes one of your building blocks. How do I group? How do I accumulate? How do I reverse a one-to-one -one mapping? Essentially, all of them use a default dict with a uh, list or a, a set. The next tool that we're going to need is Glob. The Glob module seems like it doesn't have a particularly great name. If I were to go into Glob Glob, the outer glob is the module, the inner glob is the function, and Glob Glob says expand the wildcards and perhaps the Congress data directory, R in the current directory, all of the start uh, text files, for example. Uh, would be listed uh, uh, here. So glob is kind of uh, interesting. The question is, where did its name come from? Its name came from is glob means global wildcard expansion. And when this function was created, it was exactly the right name. There was a time where Python was Unix only, and every Python programmer had Unix experience and had learned Bash. And in Bash, the way you uh, what it's called when you expand a wildcard is globbing. In fact, the part of the Glash reference manual that mentions this is called globbing. So when this was introduced to Python, if it had been called anything other than glob, people would have come to Python and said, I've looked everywhere and I can't find it. How do you glob in Python? But a lot of years have passed and not many people know that word anymore. So if it were being renamed today, it would probably be called OS Expand Wildcards. In modern times, we tend to uh, spell out names a little bit more fully. In modern times, we tend to use a uh, underscore here in the uh, variable name, and we keep all the characters lowercase, and we don't use any odd terms like glob. So I contend that glob was well named at the time of introduction, but the name no longer makes a lot of sense. Our next topic is how to open a file that has an encoding in it. It'll become more and more common to have files that have uh, Unicode in, inside. We've gotten used to every file as just plain text, but in fact, more and more people are using smart quotes, trademark symbols, M dashes, N dashes, or they have non-ASCII uh, characters in their name. So let's go look at such a uh, file. I'll try to open it uh, normally. Let's open the, uh, the data that I've downloaded from uh, uh, Congress, and we have the congressional votes for uh, Senate Bill 820. Uh, open that file and go to uh, print it. You'll notice that there was a Unicode decode error, and what's going on is that there's a non-ASCII character inside. This is fairly easy to cope with. When we go to open the file, we can also specify the encoding. I'll widen my screen a little bit so it's clear what we're doing. And you can see if you add the encoding to it, it'll translate it into Unicode. And so that's a fairly straightforward operation and something that you should get used to because more and more files will come with some kind of encoding and you don't want the file open to fail. The next one up is how to use next or i slice to remove elements from an iterator. Suppose I had a uh, simple iterator over a string. One way to get a piece of data out of the iterator is to call next on it. 
One of the interesting things about next is it not only fetches the next value, it consumes one element of the iterator. So I can consume another element here, which means that the iterator is now pointing at the letter C. Another tool that consumes an iterator, but consumes it completely, is list. Interestingly, the list doesn't start at the beginning. After all, two elements of the iterator have been consumed already, and so it picks up at the C and lists all the way through the end. So a good intermediate level Python skill is how to consume uh, some of an iterator and then pass it around to another function. This is really handy when you have uh, some header information uh, in an iterator. You want to pull out the headers and then pass over to some loop, being able to loop over the main body of data. So a really good skill is being able to pass around partially consumed iterators. It's remarkably easy to do. We run iter to get an iterator. We run next to consume some values. And then we hand it over to a high volume function, a for or a list or a tuple or sorted or whatnot that will consume the iterator all the way to the end. The next one up is how do we parse data like this up here? We can do it by using a split on the uh, commas, but that's not nearly as robust or as fast as using the CSV module. The CSV module is remarkably easy to use. You wrap an object in a CSV reader, so import CSV, and now when we open the uh, file for the congressional information, I can loop over all of the rows or row in the CSV reader, we'll file F, and we can print the row. Notice how what it has done for us is split each row into a list, broken it into the appropriate fields. It treated two consecutive delimiters as a, uh, indicating an empty field. And the first couple of rows here are, one, some identification of the information. This is Senate Vote 20 on the Sanctions Enforcement Act. And this is all of the headers describing what the various fields are. So the CSV reader takes care of uh, parsing this for us. It's written in Python, but it also has a uh, C extension in front of it. And so the CSV reader tends to run very, very fast, and it tends to be very flexible as compared to you just running a uh, split on a comma. It can also handle quoting inside the CSV file, uh, which is important if uh, someone has a uh, comma in one of the fields in their name. The quoting uh, will help separate that from uh, the field separator itself. The next skill which is a Python fundamental, is uh, tuple packing and unpacking. We can build a tuple quite easily with parentheses and commas on the right-hand side of the equal sign. The data type here is a tuple, and taking these individual elements and putting it together is called tuple packing. We're putting all of our data together in a suitcase, and the suitcase has contents of length 4. Unpacking is where the commas are on the left-hand side of the equal sign, we can bring out the fields. It's the first name, last name, age, and email address, and unpack the person tuple into separate fields. So on the right side of the equal sign, the commas pack. On the uh, left side of the equal sign, the commas unpack. Next exercise is fun. Those of you who watched some of my uh, videos on, uh, on YouTube will already know a little bit about the uh, core Python looping idioms. They're somewhat straightforward. I'll give a, a, a traditional data set that I like to use. I have a set of uh, names, Raymond, Rachel, Matthew. This is a common way to enter a list, which is to type a string and then split it. It's a little easier to type and a little easier to uh, edit later on. We'll have some associated colors. Raymond, of course, is red. Rachel is blue. Matthew is yellow. And then I'll put in the names of some cities, Austin, Dallas and Austin. So these will be our uh, data that we'll use to cover Python core looping idioms. Our first task is to just simply loop over uh, the names and we'll print them title case or uppercase. Here's the old-fashioned way of doing it. The hint that you're doing it wrong is the uh, square brackets. Python does support indexing. That said, it's not particularly fast at uh, uh, indexing, and it's a very low-level way of thinking. The more elegant way to write this code is to loop over the list directly. We'll show the, uh, compare and contrast the two different ways. The second way is shorter. The second way is clear. The second way is uh, faster. 
The next task is to loop over all of the names and show their position in a list. A traditional way uh, to do this is to loop over the indices and to show that Raymond is the first element in the list and Matthew is the third element in the list. But conceptually, what we're doing is enumerating, so there's a higher level construct for that, for I and name, and enumerate the names, telling it to start the count from 1. Otherwise, it defaults to 0. Print I and the name. The second way is clearer about what it does. The second way is faster in Python. And uh, the second way, because it names enumerate, lets you know uh, precisely what you're trying to do. I also like that you can control the start argument for enumerate. The next task is to print out all of the colors, but in reverse order. There's a traditional way to do that for i in the range, and we need to get the indices going over the length of the colors, minus 1, looping down to minus 1, excluding minus 1, and then decrementing the step of each one. Finally, we can show the ith color. If we've done this correctly, yellow should show first. This code is awful. It's fairly hard to get right. An amazing number of people will put the second argument at zero, which will omit the uh, final color, or they'll forget the minus one uh, here. It used to be the idiom for how you loop backwards. The more modern idiom is to simply loop directly for color in reversed colors, print the color. It's much clearer about what it does, and interestingly, it's faster than the other way. The hint that you're doing it wrong is using the square brackets. Now the next task is to bring names together with the uh, colors and bring them together pairwise. If there's any more names than colors, omit the unpaired item. If there's any more colors than names, omit the unpaired items. Here was the traditional way to do it. We want n is the number of times to loop will be the minimum of the number of names or the number of colors. We loop over the indices to the smaller of those two values and print out the ith name is associated with the ith color. This is called lockstep iteration, and it brings the values together pairwise, associating Raymond with red, Rachel with blue, Matthew with yellow. But there's a better way, and the better way uses a zip. We can zip together the names and colors, and print the name and the color. The second way is clearer about what its intention is, it's shorter than the first one, and the second way is also faster. There's a lot to like about it. Zip has been around for a very long time. It was present in early versions of Lisp, although it had an unusual name. I think it was called Map Car, which is not nearly as clear as Zip, which suggests bringing together items uh, like a zipper. Although a real zipper interleaves, a Python uh, zipper brings elements head to head. Raymond with red, Rachel with blue, Matthew with yellow. The next task is to show all of the colors, but in alphabetical order. The color, in sorted colors, print the color. I think this reads very nicely. Show me the sorted colors. As you learned in a previous lesson, you can also apply key functions. A key function is a function uh, that takes one argument, and it will transform one of these elements into a key that will be used as a sort key. So, an example would be, the key function is len. I would like to sort all of these colors by their length. This is the shortest color at three characters. This is the longest color at uh, six characters. The last task is to loop over all of the cities without duplicates. Currently, our cities looks like this, and we have duplicates. The tool for eliminating uh, duplicates in Python is set for city in the set of all of the cities, print those cities. What's interesting about all these looping idioms is they compose together very nicely. For instance, Chicago is out of alphabetical order. We can fix this by using sorted. For those of you who know SQL, this would parallel the query, select city from cities, order by city, and we want to make them distinct. The way you say distinct in Python is set. The way you say order by in Python 
is sorted. And these tools compose really nicely. We could reverse all of those and put them in reverse order, like this, so that Houston goes first. Further, we could count them using enumerate, and that will give us the position number for the city, by default counting from zero, unless we set the uh, start argument up to a higher value. You can go further, and we could uh, somewhere in here perhaps put in a map, the unbound method, stir upper. This style of programming is called functional programming, where we take the output of one function into the next, and the glue that holds them all together is each one of them emits an iterator and consumes an, uh, an iterator. And this shows that all the Python core looping idioms can be composed together rather nicely. It would be quite rare and unusual to actually put this many together, but you could, and whenever you need to snap two pieces together to compose, it's easier to do that than it is to try and break it out into smaller pieces. And a little review of our collections counter will be in order. Let me clear up our screen here. Import collections. And what are counters good for? They're good for counting things. How many reds have we seen so far? A regular dictionary would give a key error here, but a counter is suitable for incrementing counts. How many blues have we seen? Plus equal one. And we see another red. And so the state of the counter is we have two reds and one blues. So counters are wonderful for counting things, hence the name counter. Uh, the technique is to make an instance of it and then to look up values and increment them uh, by one. Some nice features of the counter we discussed before are there is a most common method. What is the one most common pair or the two most common? By default, it gives you everything. And another tool was we could list out all of the elements, which expands them by their multiplicity, showing both of the two reds and the one blue. The very last uh, topic is assertions. Assertions take a statement that's supposed to be true, verifies that it's true, and then doesn't complain about it. However, if you give it an incorrect assertion, it complains by raising exceptions. So it's used for checkpointing your program when you believe that there's certain assumptions that are uh, true, they're supposed to be true at that point, and you just want to uh, check them. You put in an assertion. Uh, the more complex your manipulations, the more likely it is that you're going to need assertions to help you uh, debug the uh, program. And that wraps up uh, this lesson. We now have all of the tools we need, our looping idioms, uh, knowing uh, several ways to use default dicks, using it for grouping, using it for uh, tabulation, uh, using it for one-to-many mappings, uh, using glob to scan, expand wildcards, reading files with encoding, uh, packing and unpacking uh, tuples, how to use a CSV reader, how to uh, increment instances of uh, a counter, and how to use uh, assertions. These tools together will allow us to express really big ideas in Python with a little amount of code, and in the next lesson, we'll uh, use it to analyze a congressional data set. I look forward to seeing you then.